Hello everyone and welcome back to day 41 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So today we continue the uh, assembly language uh, overview, how to program assembly language. Um, we're more or less just going to continue right where we left off. Um, I hope to maybe uh, finish off today what I have planned um, and um, uh, so, so, so we'll see how long today's stream goes, but uh, I would like to finish it today, but let's see how long it takes. So um, last time, a lot of the stuff we covered was sort of uh, oriented towards, um, you know, how to manage, um, say, 8-bit uh, and 16-bit arithmetic if all you have is 32-bit arithmetic, or conversely, if you only have 32-bit arithmetic, how do you manage 64-bit arithmetic? Um, and I made some notes on the latter, um, but we didn't really finish it off completely. And I feel like I owe people uh, a little bit of a follow-up uh, on 64-bit arithmetic uh, via 32-bit operations. So uh, w without claiming to have sort of authoritative, uh, sort of optimal solutions to some of those problems we raised, I am going to throw out some things I came up with um, uh, to, to hopefully satisfy people who, who ask me a bunch of questions offline. So I do want to kind of tie, tie that up a little bit. Uh, and then we'll basically continue uh, with the rest of the stuff we have planned. Uh, some of the bigger pieces like, you know, how do you handle functions, uh, structured control flow, uh, short circuiting expressions like, you know, and and or short circuiting uh, operators and whatnot. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things we, we stopped uh, with was noting that um, risk five and, and I said a few others, and I believe this includes, doesn't include ARM, but it includes MIPS, for example, which, uh, you know, is an earlier risk. Um, they don't have carry flags or add with carry or anything like that. So you have to kind of synthesize uh, ads from that. And um, I played around a little bit uh, offline to to see uh, what I could come up with, and there's there's uh, there's a hint in the manual, and someone mentioned it. Um, if you want to do unsigned overflow checking, they recommend this. Uh, you can use this as the basis for a branchless uh, add with carry operation. So let me just uh, let me just explain that. Um, if you want to do 32-bit you know, suppose uh, suppose we want to add. Let me call it ALBH or ALH BLBH. Not to be confused with um, so. Um, to do this, we of course we first start with um, um, the result will be stored in CLCH. So the first thing we do is uh, for the for the lower half, of course, we can just do this. So we add uh, the lower part of A and B. Um, and so far, so good that that was the easy part. Now we have to figure out whether there is a carry that we have to propagate into um, the higher half. And uh, the way we can do that is we can um, we can compare um, CL to so let me call this T1. We can compare CL to either of the operands, and we have to do an unsigned comparison. Because um, if and only if there is a carry, CL will wrap around with respect to both of the operands. It can't it can't lap the operands because the largest possible uh, offset is you know two to the thirty two minus one, which will almost but not quite lap uh, either of the operands. So by doing this comparison, um, will be zero one. Uh, will be the carry of, okay. Um, so now we have the carry as a zero or one value in T1. And um, if you now do uh, this part here, um, you can simply uh, add this in. 
And actually, I guess we could maybe do it like this. We could directly uh, initialize ch to be the result of this, so it contains 0, 1, depending. Um, now, I guess we always need an extra add, so that doesn't really help us. Um, so yeah, let's do it like this. And I mean, you could do it like that as well if you want. So you can. Um, so yeah, that should be it. So um, one interesting note is I thought about what would it require to generalize this if you wanted to do multi-precision arithmetic, where you're you're not only propagating the carry from the lower half into the higher half, which uh, this should suffice to do. Um, but also you then want to propagate the carry from, say, the next upper part to the part after that. Like suppose you're doing 128-bit arithmetic or arbitrary precision arithmetic. Uh, this actually gets even hairier because both this part and this part um, can yield a carry. And so you ha from, from what I can tell, you, you end up having to, if you wanted to calculate the, the overall carry from the upper half, you would have to detect that separately for, for both of these two. Uh, for both this ad and this ad, so uh, something to uh, something to keep in mind. But for the th when you're just doing the 32-bit case and you don't, uh, or the 64-bit case, and you don't care about the output carry from the 64-bit ad, uh, which usually you don't if you're doing if you're implementing, for example, you know C 64-bit edition, you don't care about that. Um, all right, so I think that's it as far as that goes. So how much extra work is that? It's basically twice the number of instructions, twice the number of cycles, because these ads are, you know, the LU is going to be uh, support single cycle ads, and, and all of these will be single cycles. So this basically doubles the cost of this sort of thing. However, um, you know, com compared to higher latency stuff like multiplications, maybe it's uh, maybe it's not so bad, but it does seem to me that um, there's definitely workloads where this kind of thing could could seriously matter. But uh, what do I know? But uh, th that's what jumps out to me. So that's um, that's addition, and uh, let's let's cover multiplication. I mentioned here that, uh, and I'll, I'll, let me just bring it up. If you go to the uh, M extension, which is where the uh, multiply and divide instructions are, keep in mind that the base uh, integer ISA doesn't require multiplication and division, but there is a standard extension. Um, if you, um, if you want to calculate, you know, if you want to multiply two 32 bit registers and get the, you know, the lossless 64 bit result, you have to do two instructions. You do mall for the lower half, and then you do mall H either the signed or unsigned uh, version in order to compute the upper half. Um, and so I just want to show you how you can use that to do a, um, 64 bit by 64 bit uh, multiply uh, quickly. I'll, I'll sketch it out at least. So the idea is the following. Uh, again, suppose we want to compute uh, C equals A times B. Um, want to calculate, um, break, uh, as before, break them, uh, break them into 32 bit parts. And here we're going to write it sort of. Uh, I guess uh, algebraically, so we're going to um, we're going to uh, basically, you know, we have so CL is strictly between zero and two to the thirty-two, and so um, this is just writing everything in base two to the thirty-two, um, and so if you um, if you break this into components, let me just show you how the, the math goes. You haven't seen this before. Um, then, uh, basically, the idea is you multiply these things out. So, for example, to compute the lower 32 bits of the result, all you care about are the so al uh, al times bl is a 64-bit result. Um, but let me just write that out. Uh, let me just write out the, the terms first, and then we'll um, 
and then I'll, I'll show you what parts kind of how, how things group up in terms of the upper and lower 32 bits of the result. Um, so there's uh, AL times BH and AH times BL. And then there is um, 2 to the 64 uh, AH, BH. Um, we want to calculate this uh, mod 264. So the last term vanishes. And then we want to break this into the upper and lower 32 bit halves. Um, so CL, which is the lower half, is going to be um, essentially, you know, the lower. So, so, so AL times BL is going to be a 64 bit result. And we care about. So let me just use these operators here just to make it clear. Uh, this basically, hopefully it's self-explanatory, but low and high, low is like taking things modulo two to the 32, high is shifting things over by 32 spots or dividing by two to the 32. Uh, two. So uh, for, for CL, that's just this lower part. Uh, for CH, it's the, um, let's see, it's the high part of this, plus the low part of um, of this and the low part of um, AHBL. I think that's right. Um, and so, you know, what I'm writing is low and high. Those are directly the outputs of uh, mol and mol H respectively. For those operands, um, so you can you can calculate the low and high products using um, and then you have to uh, do the adds. Um, keep in mind there are no carries from um, from the low part, okay. um, since only the upper half of the result involves uh, additions, um, and we don't care about anything beyond 64 bits. So um, looked like something like this. So let's see if I can hopefully not embarrass myself, but um, this is the idea. Um, um, let's see. That is what it's called, right? Mall HU. Mall HU of uh, LBL and then mall of um, I guess I, I'll, I'll just do like this. So I'll put one part directly into the result and then I'll put these into temps. Um, uh, so this is what ALBH and then you add that in and then AHBL and you add that in. So I think that's it. Um, maybe this is more detail than this deserves, but I did want to um, to cover that since uh, I, I wasn't quite prepared to talk about it last time, and I thought a little bit about it off stream this morning. So hopefully um, this explains it. Oh, and one more thing I want to vote on. What about 64-bit um, comparisons um, in terms of 32-bit comparisons? Um, equality is easy. Um,
So And so you know depending on Um, so hopefully this makes sense. If you want to see whether uh, a 64-bit value is equal to another 64-bit value when it's broken into 32-bit parts, uh, those are equal if and only if the lower halves are equal and the upper halves are equal. And if you're doing a, a logical comparison, like if you're saying, you know, if these two numbers are equal, what, what I'm trying to convey here um, is that you can either, you know, you can either do like a short circuiting. Basically, you can either implement the AND as short circuiting or bitwise, right? Like depending on what you want to do. Um, the the short circuiting version can be faster if uh, the branch is very well predicted, for example. Like if you expect um, things to be unequal most of the time, then uh, the branch will sort of early out on the second part. But I mean, in any case, it's a few cycles. It's not a big deal. Um, inequality. Um, is only a little bit trickier. Um, we just have to do lexicographic comparisons. So if you want to do, let, let me just do one of them because they're all the same basically, right? Um, a, a, ALAH is less than BLBH if and only if either, there's two possibilities as and always with lexicographic comparisons, either the more significant parts um, have to uh, dominate so AH has to be less than BH, or um, they have to be equal, and then the lower the, the lower halves are ordered in whatever way you're checking. Um, here's a possible implementation. So let's see. Oh no, actually, like it's. Um, all right, so hopefully, um, is quite a bit more complicated, so I won't cover that here. Um, yeah, let's not cover division. I actually don't know offhand the simplest way to do it. I know how to do multi, like multi-precision division, but I've never thought about this specific case in detail. Um, so maybe I'll revisit that, but um, it's going to be pretty slow, I think. And also, if you look at um, Risk Five, it has no help for um, doing. You know, if you look at um, let's see here. If you, if you look at, for example. Um, at the um, so if you look at something like x86 the division instruction is actually dividing a 64-bit quantity by a 32-bit quantity which uh, is kind of the uh, the inverse of how when you multiply two 32-bit quantities, you get a 64-bit product. This is sort of the converse. So um, because if you multiply, sorry, if you divide a 64-bit quantity by a 32-bit quantity, um, the result, um, like the quotient, um, can fit in, in 32 bits. Um, or sorry, in, in six, yeah, 32 bits. So uh, there's nothing like that here. So it's sort of like they didn't, yeah, they don't have anything like that in, in the M extension. So you have to do even more work than yourself uh, on your own. And just in general, this is more complicated. Uh, so let's not cover that. But uh, I think this stuff here is probably um, sort of easy to understand and the, the more commonly occurring stuff already. 64-bit divides are also expensive, even when they're available directly in silicon. I think... 
on even the newer Intel microarchitectures, uh, integer divides are like 17 cycles, even for 32-bit. And the 64-bits are like even more. I can't actually remember offhand, but they're very expensive. You obviously want to avoid them where possible, um, unless you can cover the latency. All right. Um, Let's see here. Um, what is next on the menu? Um, let's cover arrays quickly and pointers, I guess. Um, Um, all right, so arrays. If you have an array, um, if given a base pointer, uh, uh, P, uh, is equivalent to Oh, this translates to assembly. So for example, suppose um, suppose you want to do something like this. Um, so we have some pointer P. Um, I'm going to write it out. I'm just going to write it like this. Do it like that. Um, oh, sorry, this is. Convert it back. I'll just write it like that. Let's make a few typos. Um, all right, something like this. So now we're at this point. Um,
Uh, now you can do uh, shift left, logical, um, by two. And sometimes when I'm doing these translations, even though in the C code, I will often use separate variables. Uh, when it's obvious, I will just reuse those variables. Uh, so I won't have both T1 and T2. I will just uh, overwrite T1 in the process. So in this case, um, I mean, and, and if you don't want to keep around P, you can even overwrite P in place, right? Um, but uh, other than that, um, I mean, you can even do something like this, um, which is probably the right thing to do here. Um, so add to X, uh, P and X, um, and then finally, uh, load uh, load from the address in X and overwrite X. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, someone's asking about AH, AL. Now, AH and AL, uh, AL just means, those are just names for two registers, right, that, ha that contain the upper and lower half. Um, like, a, a and B are the registers logically, AL and AH are just the names for whatever registers or variables contain the upper and lower part. I just don't want to write low and high all the time. So those are the shorthands. Um, all right. So yeah, this is uh, this is how you do pointer arithmetic. Um, uh, so, yeah. So, so so one thing I want to note here is that people are so used to subtracting pointers in C code. Um, It looks innocent enough at the C level, um, but actually involves an implicit divide at the assembly level. All right. Um, so yeah, if you want to do this, uh, like if you want to expand at the C level what this corresponds to, um, you would, I mean, um, I guess it would be int pointer. Does it matter in this case?
do they actually have immediate i'm going to show you why you wouldn't want to do this every compiler in the universe pretty much does uh, an optimization for division by constants which is really important given how expensive constants uh, or given how expensive divides are even on modern processors uh, i guess there's there's nothing like that we call it naive conversion don't do this. Um, um Uh, for optimizing division uh, divisions by constants. So, um, right. So basically, this is what it corresponds to naively. So, for example, if we were dealing with um, a vector of, you know, 32 bit ints or 16 bit ints or floats. Uh, or not that they're 16-bit flows, but like, you know, 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit, 256-bit, any of these nice powers of 2, all of this stuff would be, there, there would be absolutely no uh, no question about what to do um, because this would just be a right shift, right? Um, and if it was a signed division, you would, you know, you would have to take care because of, um, of, of the fact that um, when you have a two's complement, you have to be a little bit more careful than just than just doing the shift but um, pretty much that's it uh, but the, the the thing that's more tricky is when you have things like this which is not uncommon right like this is about one of the the, the things you see all the time which is hey i have three elements that are four bytes each so i have 12 bytes and uh that's not a power of two you can't just shift um and actually let me uh let me show you uh, what what a compiler does, um, what a C compiler does. Actually, I wonder if it does it in, even in unoptimized mode. So uh, I'll, I'll show you what it does, and then I'll explain it. I guess it'll inline it and we won't be able to see something. Let me see first what it does in debug mode. Uh, actually, I guess if we make these um, globals, it probably won't be able to know what what to do. But no, I guess it will because the addresses are known, so that doesn't really work. Um, let me do this. Hopefully that will fool the compiler. Well, let's first look at debug. Just set this up as startup project as well. I think this one is worth just not deep diving on, but just showing it to you because I think this is one case where C programmers who don't look at assembly code much probably would not realize that subtracting two pointers involves an implicit division. Um, so hopefully, by spending just five minutes on it, uh, we will, uh, this will stick in your brain if, if it's not something you're familiar with. Um, yeah, so do you see how it, um, do, do you see how, and this is an IDIV, so this is the sign counterpart, do you see how it's actually doing a division by RCX, which is 12, this is 12 in hex. Um, incidentally, just a, a small note, if 
do you remember I said before when we were talking about division how uh, x86 does it divides a 64-bit quantity by a 32-bit quantity? Um, this operator here is, does conversion, so this is a con I guess a sign extension from quad to oct. So this is from uh, a 32-bit quantity to a 64-bit quantity, um, and um, this fills in, I guess, is it RDX or ED, EDX or whatever. It, anyway, it fills in, I guess it's, if it's Q from this, it's actually 128 bits it fills in. Uh, so this, I guess it's uh, RDX, that's the upper half. So you have to always fill this in before you do an IDIV on X60, uh, on X86 or X64. Um, so if you ever see these, it used to be C, back in the 32-bit days, it would always be CDQ because it would go from 32-bit extended up to 64-bit. Uh, here it's because we're now extending from 64-bit to 128-bit, it goes from Q to O. So O is for oct, you know, quad and oct. Anyway, small note. So this is the unoptimized version. Um, but if we move to uh, release, hopefully it doesn't optimize stuff out entirely. That's always the danger of doing these sort of simple snippets, uh, is that it can sometimes be hard to avoid the compiler from being too clever. Like here, yeah. Um, so, uh, let's do something like that. I hope. Okay, so it inlined the function. Um, it inlined the function, but didn't didn't eliminate it. It looks like. Um, so what you'll note here is that it loaded this, this very weird constant into RAX, which is one of the multiplication operands. So IMOL has two implicit inputs. One of them is RAX. So that's just a hard-coded uh, input. Uh, you know, the, in the old, olden times, A was the accumulator, and so it was kind of an implicit input. Um, but and for the multiplier, it still is. Um, so the the first uh, multiplier is this, which is this weird hex number. Like it looks completely bizarre. Um, so you can see that it takes whatever is an R8, and I guess we skipped some code, but you know R8 presumably has been loaded. Well, and it's currently zero because these are all globals. But if they had been modified by other code, this this would be uh, a different value, um, or I guess the difference between the two. Uh, so it's multiplying that by this weird constant, uh, and then it's the output is going to be split between RAX and RDX, I believe. So it's doing an arithmetic right shift. So um, this is assigned assigned division by two. And the reason it's assigned by division by two rather than some bigger shift is because 12 is even, right? 12 is uh, the biggest power of two that divides it is two. I mean, it, it's, it's also, no, that's not, it should be more than that, right? Let me think about it. The biggest power of two that divides it is, is um, four. Okay, so maybe so maybe I don't quite remember the exact recipe. I thought you always had to divide by the biggest power of two that divides the divisor. Um, and do the shift for that. Um, but anyway, you can see maybe that's what this is about. Um, so it shifts that, and then it moves into RAX, and then it further shifts it, and this is a logical shift at this point, and then it adds it in. Yeah, so I don't remember the exact recipe. Um, but the point is, there is an algorithm which uh, basically every compiler uses. I would say even compilers that don't try to optimize will generally have some version of this um, because it's kind of a, if you're doing pointer arithmetic, it's really the difference between night and day when it comes to performance. Um, and so what it does is basically what, what it ends up doing is it turns, it turns a division by a constant into a multiplication and some shifts. Um, 
And so it's, it's basically going to be dominated by the multiplication, which is, you know, it, it, I think multiplication on a modern x86 processor is like four cycles of latency. Um, and division is closer to 20, like 17 or something. Um, and so, the, you know, this is a factor of, of at least probably four or something like that overall. So this is a pretty substantial savings and uh, there's a standard algorithm for doing this. Uh, so I just wanted to, um, I guess we won't cover that in detail here, um, but you can look it up. Um, all right. Uh, okay, let's leave it at that for the point arithmetic stuff. Um, let's talk about structs. Um, structs and unions. Um, are handled by calculating, you know, the sizes and offsets of uh, of the fields, and then using uh, using them um, uh, as explicit offsets when uh, referencing fields of Uh, and then doing explicit offset arithmetic when referencing fields. Um, and so let me show you what I mean um, while staying in C code. So um, let's maybe take this vector from before. Actually, let me let's write it like this because always I always forget how to write it. Um, so as before, say we have this um, this vector struct. Actually, let's make these ints um, because I don't want to cover the floating point instructions if we end up wanting to do something with them in this sample. So um, let's see here. So right. So for, so first, suppose that V is some kind of static, and the reason I'm calling it that is I want to. Um, the, I'll, I'll mention this in a sec, but basically, when you're working with structs, I mentioned before that for the most part, uh, and I'll talk about what happens when you can't do it. But for the most part, we'll assume that all local variables are in registers, and that applies to structs as well. If you have a struct like a vector struct, and you're going to be using all the um, you know you're going to be referencing you know x y and z you're going to be referencing all the fields uh, I'll, i will assume that you basically load the fields as independent registers when you when you would otherwise load the vector um, in the same way that when we were talking about 64-bit um, uh, doing do, working with 64-bit integers on a 32-bit machine I, I assumed we split uh, the lower and upper half into separate registers it's sort of the same idea when you're dealing with structs you're splitting the parts into separate word size registers um, and trying to keep them there when it uh, when it's possible and useful to do so so but anyway let me talk about this offset math so suppose i want to um to do something like int x equals or let's do something less obvious, int y equals uh, v dot y. Um, and so let's let's talk about what this conversion does, uh, or one way of looking at it is, um, I guess the first thing I would note is that anytime you're dealing with, with globals like this uh, and you're referencing them, you should, unless you've already loaded and cached the value in the current context, like, you know, you don't have to reload it, uh, if you're referencing v in an inner loop and you know no one else is touching it, like you're not calling another function that could modify v, you can only you can load v once into a register and just reference it repeatedly. But um, if it's the first time you're referencing it in a given context, 
essentially what you're doing. And I'm going to write it in a really weird way. Like I'm going to write it kind of like this, um, which for an L value is a no op, but I want to emphasize that V has an address. And when you're dealing with V in assembly language, the thing you're dealing with is really V's address. So you're, you have to explicitly load it when you're referencing it in an R value context. You have to explicitly store to it when you're using it in an L value context when you're doing assignments. So I'm going to be writing it in this little bit of a awkward way from a C perspective, but one uh, that is hopefully very explicit. And so, um, um, and actually I just realized, uh, let me, I think this is better. I realized I've been using, this is what I do in my own code, but I think that's probably, where's the, I want to remove the regular expression stuff. Um, Let me just do that so I remember it. Um, because I want to kind of emphasize that the arithmetic we're doing is not really pointer arithmetic at this, in some sense. I mean, we're just uh, treating everything numerically. So um, we have the address of V, which is really just where the, the global or the static lives. And um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the offset of the field I want to load. Um, which is vector y. And then I'm going to turn that back into whatever type I'm trying to load from. Um, convert field access to explicit offset math. Um, so this is basically what it entails. You have an address for V, and that's what, when I'm taking the address here, that's what I'm trying to convey. And then I'm treating it as, you know, just like a flat address. And then I'm adding the offset of the field Y, which is going to be, um, let me break this into separate lines so I can add line comments more easily. This assumes certain conventions about, I mean, actually this is going to be al almost universally true. Um, but I'm just gonna write it like the, the flat values, the immediate values, even though yeah, a given architecture can define size event to be something weird if it wants to. Um, And so in this case, I'm going to be using V um, let's see. And then we have to do a, a load into y. Oh, actually, that's that. Yeah, so let me write this. I don't know what I was thinking. Let me write this just to show what you don't want to do. Um, There are people outside my window doing work. So I'm just going to move down, lower my curtain. Uh, all 
All right, so yeah, th this is me being stupid. This is not what you want to do for this kind of stuff. You want to exploit the fact that uh, loads and stores have uh, have the ability to take a register and add a small, well, small meaning anything that's uh, a 12-bit immediate plus minus, like it's assigned 12-bit immediate uh, to the register. So if, if V... Maybe let me do that. Um, actually, that's an interesting question. Um, in this case, we can fold the offset math into the LA. So maybe this is not really that naive. Let me just call this. Let me cover two cases. Um, Um, So suppose you want to do, you want to load all of these. And I'm not going to write all the intermediate steps. I'm just going to go, um, um, Something like this. So, all right, um, let's see here. Does that make sense? So basically, if you were just loading an isolated field from something, uh, I think this would be, actually, it wouldn't really be better. I think, I actually don't think there's ever a reason to prefer this because this is going to be three instructions and they're all three cycle. I mean, two cycles for this one, and then this the load. Um, but even if I only do this once, that's still let, let me do it that way. Um,
Um, All right. I do it like that. All right. Okay. I think that's it. Um, so I guess the, the main thing to mention uh, aside from this is, um, you know, in order to calculate um, offsets and sizes, Structs uh, their fields. You know, you you have to um, know um, you know the the ABI's expectations or conventions uh, like packing and alignment uh, conventions. And I'm not going to go into that here. If you watched uh, some of the earlier Bitwise stuff, you can go and look at um what is it complete struct like it's this kind of thing here um which shows you how to calculate size and alignment for c types c style types uh, it's the it's compatible with that um which is mostly just you you know you um you have some target alignment and uh every time you add a new field you always round up the running offset to that alignment and then you just keep going until you're done with all the offsets and the struct and then finally the final size of the struct is the final offset rounded up to the structs overall alignment and that's the size and so on um, so anyway won't go into that here but um, that's that's how if you want to calculate the right offsets like in this case here it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious right size of int is four Starts at offset zero, uh, and then you have uh, you have this running offset that starts zero, goes four, eight, and then the overall struct a size of vector is going to be eight because eight is already four byte aligned. So the overall alignment of the struct is four because there is no there's nothing that requires wider alignment than four, and so if you round up f uh, eight to the nearest multiple of eight, you get eight. But for example, if you had um, you know, if you were doing something like this as a, as a 
uh, as, as another example. In this case, uh, this would be like that, and the size would be three. Um, but if, for example, something like this happened, then uh, this would be like uh, four because of upward alignment five and this would be rounded up to eight because it requires four byte alignment from this in field and so five rounded up to the nearest multiple of four is eight and so on so you have to know those conventions there you know once you understand how that works uh it's easy to to do easy to keep track of and the main thing i would recommend if you're writing assembly code is simply that rather than hard coding magic numbers you define off uh, offset size constants like this so that the code is uh, is not only sort of more self commenting but also if you ever want to go back and change uh, the structs, uh, the, the type definitions, it's uh, it's easy to do so. You don't have to go through your code and, and carefully change all these magic constants. Um, you know, if, and if you're dealing with unions, it's just it's it's exactly the same offset math. Uh, the only difference is now the offsets uh, are usually overlapping, right? So. If if uh, if this was a union, then you would have you would still have three fields, and they would still have offset constants. But now in that case, the offset would would all be zero. Uh, and if you had a struct within a union, then some you know the substruct has some offsets that are not overlapping, but relative to its siblings in the union, they are overlapping and so on. So anyway, standard stuff that you should know if you're a C programmer. Same stuff just applies to um, to assembly code except that it's your job to calculate the offsets and sizes. Um, but it's honestly, it's not a lot of work. Uh, the, the, main, the main pain in the butt is if you're interoperating with an existing API, um, you're usually responsible for you know, looking at the C code and carrying that over. And so there, if there's a lot of structs, it's kind of a pain in the butt to have to replicate um, the layouts manually. Um, there are, you know, it's pretty common these days to have sort of foreign function interfaces that will take C type definitions and do that kind of math for you. Uh, there are some assemblers like uh, modern assemblers that have support for types that can help you do some of this stuff. Uh, and if those facilities are available to you, you can use them. But honestly, even doing it this way is not too bad. So don't sweat it, I would say. Um All right, so I think that's it as far as uh, structs and unions goes. Um, how are we doing on time? We've been going about an hour, so plenty of time left. Um, let's not talk about functions. Maybe I'll, I'll leave that for the end because that's kind of a bigger topic and it, it starts interacting with some of our assumptions from earlier, like that we can always keep stuff in registers. Uh, which is, uh, once we deal with functions, we have to think about <clears throat> saving and restoring registers around function calls and stuff like that. Um, so let's talk about structured control flow. Let me just get a drink first. I can feel myself having to cough. Um... Um, structured control flow. I'm going to put in some, just for my own benefit, I'm going to put in some markers here to separate the different sections a little bit. Um, So, um, um,
um, it's um, Okay, so yeah, that's going to be our next topic. Um, how do you, you know, I'm going to assume that for the most part, of course, even when writing C code, it's sometimes convenient to have go-tos, right? Like I'm definitely no um, go-to hater when it makes sense, and we've used go-tos both in C and Ion, right? Um, but in general, um, I don't think it's just a modern fad that structured control flow kind of uh, dominated. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I do think people who say that GoTo is harmful, sort of unconditionally, um, uh, are, are too unnuanced in their thinking and are not able to apply sort of situational reasoning about pros and cons. But nevertheless, um, you know, I don't think it's just a historical accident that structured control flow d became dominant. I think I do think it's the best way to structure programs, broadly speaking. Um, and so. Uh, and regardless of whether it's the best way to do things in an absolute sense, certainly if you're a C programmer, that's primarily how you're used to structuring your code. And so I want to, to show you how to translate structured control flow into assembly style, conditional branches, and so on. Um, and, and again, like part of the ulterior motive for, uh, for doing these uh, overviews is that a lot of this stuff will... Um, will become useful when we're doing the compiler because uh, doing the code generating backend is essentially just implementing that kind of knowledge into a compiler. Um, uh, someone's asking who invented structured control flow? That's a good question. I know that McCarthy is credited with inventing the expression oriented uh, if operator. Um, in, actually in logic, not in programming, but it existed in Lisp as cond. Uh, and I think Cond, I mean, Fortran had structured control flow. I actually don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know exactly. It seems obvious in hindsight, but um, uh, clearly, at least, I mean, I, I guess there's two separate questions. There's who invented it in some sense. And then there's like who promoted it. Um, and I want to say that people like in the 60s, a lot of the people working on Algol were some of the big proponents of structured control flow. Um, like Viet and Dijkstra and Wiengarten and all those guys, I think were sort of the, the big proponents in the 60s, but I don't know who actually invented them. Um, and one of the interesting things, like I want to, everyone knows about, let me actually advertise this. Uh, I think this is a really good small paper to read um, and sort of reread in, in, in a modern, uh, with, with the benefit of, of modern hindsight, I guess. Um, everyone knows about, even if they haven't read it, they've heard about Dijkstra's go-to considered harmful. Um, but there's a really good paper, not really a rebuttal, but sort of a commentary uh, by Knuth on go-to uh, structured programming with go-to statements. And he makes some very good points. Um, one, one, one thing to emphasize is that when you probably when you think of um, structured control flow, if you're a C programmer like like I am and like like most of us are, um, you think of like oh the basic things that are available in, in in C except for maybe go to. So you might have the notion that go to is unstructured, but the rest of it is structured. But keep in mind that things like break and continue are were considered unstructured, I think. Um, because if you read Knuth's, uh, Knuth's paper, he has a bunch of examples. Uh, I'm not going to go through it, but he has a bunch of examples of where go-tos are, um, are helpful and where the equivalent program using what is then considered the orthodox means of structured uh, programming, structured control flow, um, would, would lead to a program, like using structure control flow for some of his examples would lead to a program that's either more complex in some sense at least, or in more inefficient. And for example, one of the standard, I mean, I can write it without even without even looking it up, but suppose you want to write a program like, um, so suppose you have an array of elements and you try, you're, you want to find the index of, um, 
of a matching element. So if there's no match, you return minus one. So you're going to return an index. Um, and uh, if there's a match, then you return the index that matches. So you want to write a function like this. Um, even this early out, I think, like, in his example, I think that's an example of something that would be considered unstructured because it's sort of an early exit rather than there being a standard exit like at the end. So for example, suppose you wanted to um, suppose you wanted to write it with a single exit sort of in the canonical structured style of the of the day, you would have to write something like this, I think. Um, and let's also maybe factor this out so it's accessible after the fact. Um, um, maybe we'll put this after. Uh, as long as we haven't found a match and, um, and the index is in bounds, then you check if something was true. And if it is, then you set this and then... Um, and then you can say, you know, if if found, then return uh, i, else uh, return minus one. And I mean, I guess if you want to be even more, maybe you would write it like this, because even this has two exits, right? You would, you would write something like this. Um, it, it, this would be the dogmatic structured programming single exit implementation if you want to have early out. Um, if you don't want early out, then you could simplify it to um, Something like this, um, but now, and I mean, I guess you could even do something like this. But the point is, all of these things make the program more complicated, at least according to most people nowadays would would, would agree that, or more inefficient. If, for example, you don't have early outs, because anytime you have an early out, like you you're searching a collection and you find a match and you want to finish, you don't want to search the whole thing because you've already found the thing you're looking for. That, that is always going to introduce additional control flow edges, right? Because now there's an extra edge for doing the early out versus finishing. Um, and so I, apparently this was a big debate once a big debate once upon a time because the way some of the examples smooth writes would be easy to write in uh, some of them not actually. Some of the error exits are things that people in C still use uh, go tos for. But a bunch of the other ones, from what I recall, are things that if you have break and continue or multiple returns rather than only a single return, um, would 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 be easy to do with what modern people would consider structured programming, but back here apparently uh, this was considered sort of suspect. Um, but anyway, just a, a small historical note. I would recommend you go read that paper. It's quite interesting uh, because yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, let me talk about uh, let me let me talk about this actual translation task um, about how to translate stuff. And the process I'm going to take is I'm going to, again, translate C to C code by um, exploiting the fact that go to's in C correspond very closely to, you know, an unconditional and conditional branches in assembly code. And as a result, um, we can actually do the structured to unstructured translation while staying in C code. So um, let me... Uh, let me show you what I mean here. Um, if you have, well, first let me just, let me do this. When I'm writing comment A and comment B, what I mean is there is a block of code that somehow goes here and I don't want to write out what it is, right? Like this is just a block of stuff. Um, and that gets carried along in the translation. So I think, well, it, maybe people don't know this, but uh, the, the standard way of translating this to assembly amounts to the following translation. Um, 
the thing you you do a conditional branch, but the thing you're testing is actually the negation of the if condition because what you're going to do is you're going to conditionally skip A and go to B. Um, um, And so this is the transformation. So this, I'm, I'm going to be using this idiom a lot because by, and I'm going to write it on a single line to emphasize that I'm thinking of this as a single phrase. Um, right, like I'm thinking of this basically as corresponding to a conditional branch uh, in assembly code. Um, so this is the translation for a an if without an else. Um, you have these two blocks, one which is guarded by the condition, and then you have the successor block, which is B. Um, and we are going to conditionally skip, um, conditionally skip to B, uh, to this label, B start, uh, if the condition is false. Um, and so let me do another, uh, let, let me do a slight extension where we have if. <clears throat> Um, all right. Um, so in this case, there's there's two things you have to do. The first is um, Um, you still have this part, but now rather than skipping to C, you skip to the else block. And so there's a B start block. And B start is immediately followed by C. So if you somehow happen to go to B and execute that, when B finishes, it just falls through the C, which is its natural successor in the program text ordering. Um, however, of course, if we uh, fall into the A, uh, the A part, once we finish A, we don't want to fall into B. So we have to jump to C start. Oh, I have to write go to here. Uh, and so we do need a label for that. But C doesn't, ha C doesn't have to jump to, you know, it doesn't have to do this because it can just fall through. Um, but that's the idea. So if you, if you look at the difference, here there's just a single conditional branch here there's a an unconditional branch at the end of a if a is taken if that if, if that positive branch is taken then we have to skip the negative uh the negative case go directly to the successor case which is uh, c um maybe i'll space it out a little bit um like that um, someone's asking if I answer questions regarding earlier streams. Um, no, it's fine. Um, someone was asking, you want to ask about the hash table. Um, if, if you wait until the end of the stream, which is probably going to be another, at least another 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, uh, you can ask about it then. That's fine. But uh, usually I don't answer non-stream related questions uh, during the stream. But uh, but yeah, let me just finish this control flow stuff and maybe we'll finish for today. Um, so um, the first thing I want to cover is do while. So so anyway, so that that's it for um, for ifs. Um, if you want to do if else if, keep in mind that else if in C is really just an if that's nested under the else. So if you repeat this translation to B, and B itself contains an if, then um, then you will get else if right. Um, so you don't need to treat that specially like you might do in some languages. Some languages have else if as a special construct. I guess one thing to note is that when you have else if, when you have these nested uh, ifs within the else uh, chain, sometimes there are some redundant chain jumps that sort of do unconditional jump from one point to a next point that immediately unconditional jumps somewhere else. Um, and if you're writing a compiler, it can be worthwhile to uh, detect those cases and and chain and and do the unconditional jump directly to the ultimate destination. 
which is one advantage of doing direct code generation for LCIF. Um, but uh, you don't need to do that if you just want to have a translation. And in any case, once you're doing, um, unlike a compiler, right, if you're doing this kind of translation by hand, it's usually obvious when there are those kinds of inefficiencies and you can just uh, short circuit that chaining. In a compiler, of course, nothing happens accidentally. You have to um, explicitly code that as, as a optimization. But uh, but anyway, so that's it for um, for ifs. Now, when it comes to loop structures, um, I'm actually going to start with um, I'm actually going to start with uh, do while, uh, which may be surprising because do while is the least used loop structure in C code. Um, but it's from an assembly perspective is the most natural loop structure. <clears throat> and it, arguably it's one reason why it's in C because it is from an assembly perspective, the most natural loop structure. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, if I have this, um, um, here is what that amounts to. So that's what it amounts to as a do-while loop. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see this is an extremely simple loop structure. Um, one thing to note is that um, the jumps here, the go-tos, the conditional go-tos, or even the unconditional go-tos, all of them were forward jumps. So you're going from earlier in the program text to later in the text. Um, and if you do an order preserving translation to assembly code, this corresponds to also a later program counter value. Um, when you get to loops, there's always going to be at least one backward jump because otherwise things couldn't repeat indefinitely, right? If you're always moving forward, eventually you're not gonna be able to keep moving forward. So anytime you have the potential for infinite looping, um, there's always going to be at least one backward branch. Sometimes there's also forward branches as we'll see in a sec, but there's always at least one backward branch. And um, do while loops are, like I said, the most canonical loop form from an assembly perspective, because look at how simple this translation is. Um, all right. Um, while loop. Um, so, so let me show you something um, potentially interesting. Oh, and actually, let me um, maybe do that, yeah put the successor block afterwards just to emphasize that there's always some successor thing uh, and if you're and if you want to support breaks uh, maybe I'll cover that in a sec I want to, don't want to cover this right here but if you want to support a break or a continue um, maybe I'll cover this here So that's how you do uh, break and continue is, you know, if in if there is a continue inside A, it means, re, you know, go and go and check the loop condition again. And if it's still true, then continue uh, from the top. And if you break, you just uh, jump past all of this stuff uh, into the successor code outside of the loop. Um, um, uh, let's see. Uh, rather than formulating while loops correctly in terms of unstructured control flow. Um, you can see them as a variation of a do, a, a, as a, uh, as an extension of a do while loop 
And so what I mean by this is if you have um, if you have this, you can look at it as follows. Um, And so uh, the, the, the point I'm making here is um, I'll, 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 after this, I will show you a version of while loops that are less efficient at the assembly level. But if you want the efficient version, the, the efficient in, uh, version at the assembly level of while loops, the best way to think about them is to think of them as while loops, do while, excuse me, as do while loops, where right as you enter the while loop for the first time, you skip the normal, normally there would be one iteration of the body, but you skip that and you go directly to the continue label, which corresponds to checking the condition and conditionally branching back if the condition holds true. Um, and so let me just unfold this to make the point. Uh, A continue. Um, something like that. Um, is that it? Actually, let me just int that this so it's more readable. better to tighten it up like that. Um, um, right. Okay. So that covers how um, that covers how you know at the C level, we're not at the assembly level but we've converted things to a subset of C that has a direct translation to assembly code. Um, but the benefit of doing it this way is that, you know, before you were perfectly fluent in assembly, this lets you kind of lean on your intuition for C uh, sort of as a bridge between C and assembly. And that's the idea. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what they looked like expressed in C. Um, now we can easily uh, translate any of these things. Any, any of these uh, unstructured uh, C snippets to assembly code. Um, so um, let's let's take the most complex we've seen so far, which is this. Um, I'm going to be using anonymous labels. Um,
Um, but yeah, so that's the loop structure. Um, on, on entry, we unconditionally jump to the where we check the condition. If the condition is still true or true for the first time, we jump back and do the loop body, which then when it's finished, falls through to check again. If this is false, we fall through to B. Um, so this is the, the loop structure for a while loop. And the only difference from a do while loop is this disappears. And so we always execute at least one iteration before we check the condition. It's really the only difference. Um, and if you haven't seen this notation, if you didn't see the compiler before, this is the equivalent of in gas, if you write, or uh, arms assembler, if you write two B or sorry two forward, which means the label the label number two searching forward because it's defined after the instruction, and this here would be equivalent in that notation of backward one B, uh, but I use this notation here, which uh, I was looking at the Luajit. Uh, or I guess it's not only in Luajit, but uh, Mike Paul's uh, Din Asm actually realized it uses this convention there too, this notation with the uh, forward and backward arrows. So maybe I got them from there without knowing it. But in any case, that's our notation. Uh, you could also use, um, you could also call them like, uh, you know, a continue. Um, actually, let me write them like that. Um, Just a Okay. Um, I'm not going to translate ifs and all these other cases because they have a straightforward translation. Instead, I do want to, before we finish up for today, I, instead I do want to talk about um, one more thing, which is um, how do you make effective use of, and this is maybe part of doing, you know, other um like handling more general sub-expressions. Um, uh, but, you know, in, in these examples, I was assuming that we have a, a single register X and we're branching based on whether it's zero or non-zero. Now, um, we can reduce a general case to that by first evaluating any arbitrary Boolean expression or not even Booleans, just anything that's non-zero, like integer-wise, um, evaluating that into a register and then branching on whether it's non-zero. But um, you also want to
Right. So anyway, uh, this is the kind of thing you should try to do. Um, this is easy to do as a human programmer. Usually, um, if you're being a lazy compiler programmer, you might find yourself trying to write code like this, generating code like this instead. Um, because otherwise you have to be aware of the context you're evaluating. Like, think of it this way. If I'm evaluating some something like x less than y in a expression context where I'm assigning it to a variable, then I have to use one code pattern to generate that value. But if I'm using it in a condition, I have to use something more specialized, namely a branch with the right condition on it and so on. So um, if you're writing a really naive compiler, it would be tempting to do something more like this. But um, both in a compiler and certainly if you're a human, it's very easy to generate this kind of code um, where you directly exploit what uh, what comparisons can be done directly as part of a conditional branch. So G stands for greater than or equal, right? If So you negate the condition when generating the, the skip code. If X is greater than or equal to Y, then we skip, we go to B start. So that's what this is encoding directly. So that's the kind of code you should try to write. Um, Um, do I have time? Okay, maybe I'll stop here. Um, the next thing I would want to cover is how to handle short circuiting. Actually, let me let me talk about this quickly. Um, uh, short circuiting, um, conditional expressions can be translated to structured control flow. Um, here I'm going to use this kind of comment notation to basically signify that A represents some expression and I'm not going to evaluate it I'm just going, to, I'm not going to unfold it. The point is this is something that has to be, you have to write code for it recursively, but it could be a compound expression in its own right. Like it contain, could contain other Boolean short circuiting operators that would then have to be expanded first. Um, so I think everyone knows, but let me just make it very clear uh, what this is. Um, Oh, sorry. L let me not do it this way. Let me do it this way. Much cleaner. I guess maybe not. Let me see. Is there a good way to trans? I mean, you could you could do it like this. <laughs> yeah. 
but let's not pretend it's structured. So that's how it goes. All of these conditions have to be true for C to uh, execute. And so we check each of them in turn, and if either of them is false, then we skip to C and go to D. Um, and this one, I'm just going to go directly to the unstructured code, um, because I think that's more representative uh, of that parallel structure. And so here, it's really, um, Actually, let, let me do it this way. Something like that. Um, and the easiest way to synthesize this code is, actually, I don't know if this is the best way to do it. Um, Let's try it. Oh yeah, here we go. Morgan's Laws. Just no, that doesn't work. We have to negate the whole thing. Okay, let, let, let me. Okay, let's see here what the best thing to do is. Okay, like that. Um, and let me just do that translation directly because I think this is simpler to see what's going on. So in other words, um, we check each of the possible conditions under which C can execute. And if any of them is true, then we go to C and execute that. But if none of them execute, then we eventually fall through here to destart uh, and, and execute that. So. That's probably, okay, let's say that's it for today. Um, let's see how we got. I think the only major thing I didn't really cover that I wanted to cover was functions, and that's a bigger topic. Um, there's some other stuff that I want to talk about. It's kind of related, like what, what happens when you have more locals than can fit in registers um and things like that but a lot of that i think can be covered under the function topic because again even if you have enough registers to fit all your local variables you have to push and pop stuff that are color any color save registers have to be saved and restored around function calls um so a lot of that stuff will maybe uh, be treated under there so i don't think that will take a full hour uh, next time or an hour and a half so maybe i'll cover that as a 30 minute section before moving to the next topic on monday but um yeah, we covered a bunch of stuff here. Um, you know, already I think this would let you write most programs. Um, 
anything that doesn't involve subroutines or maybe you could figure out how to do simple subroutines yourself but um, this is covering a whole bunch of stuff so I think this is enough for now uh, if yeah so if someone uh, had a question about hash tables I'm happy to answer that if you want to ask it uh, if you have questions about if anyone has questions about this stuff we covered uh, that would also be great All right, so let me repeat the question to the stream if people are watching the recording. Regarding your hash table, specifically your string intern table, so let me just bring up that code. Um, string intern range. Um, I'm having a hard time visualizing how it handles collisions. Assuming you're adding a new string to the existing table and the hash collides, even if rare, when we get to map put hashed, if, we, if, if you use the hash as the key, won't it just override any existing hashes? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So basically what happens is there's only ever going to be one entry with um, with a given hash. Um, and that entry is essentially going to be the length, or sorry, it's going to be the head of an external chain. Uh, unless, I, and it's also possible that I have a bug by the way, but I don't think so. But basically, um, you can see here, um, suppose, so, so let me just make an extreme, extreme example. Suppose that this hash is actually zero, okay? So this is a really shitty hash function, even though there's uh, two to the 64 possible values and, and with a good hash function, you're going to be widely distributed. Suppose, suppose that every single string hashes to zero. So that means they're all going to collide to the same entry of the hash table. So what happens in that case? Because that's the, that's the extreme case of what you're asking about. So what happens is this entry here, there's only going to be one entry in the hash table that has that value zero, uh, that key zero. Um, and that entry is going to be the head pointer of a linked list chain, which is what we get back here. And so essentially that thing is externally chained. So even if it's with a good hash function, this is almost never going to happen. There's only ever going to be zero or one entry under an existing, under a key, if we have a good hash function that's 64 bits. But assuming there is a collision, like in this extreme case where everything collides, um, they're essentially just going to become part of this single external chain that, that is has a head pointer, which is what is in the hash table, and which you then follow through by following these next pointers. And so that's the idea. Um, and so you can see if we find a match in that linear chain that's externally chained, we return that. Otherwise, we make a new head of the chain. We make its successor be the old head of the chain, which is what we do here. Uh, and then we override the existing entry so that the next time someone searches for that hash, they're going to find the new head of the chain, whose successor will be the old head of the chain, and so on. So that's the idea. Um, so it's a little bit of an unconventional way of doing these string hash tables. Um, and in order to be efficient, you need this chain to be very small in general. Uh, and I've, we've actually tested it, um, stress tested this previously to show that, um, in fact, using a 64-bit hash is probably exaggerated. Even with a 32-bit hash, uh, you're going to get some birthday collisions, but it's going to be very rare, even with millions of strings. Um, so, uh, but in any case, yeah, the way we handle it is that the thing that lives in that hash table in this map is only the head of the chain of things that have the same hash value. That's the idea. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, uh, feel free to ask a follow-up. So yeah, so this map here stores the head of the chain, and then things are externally chained from there. Um, but unlike a normal externally chained hash table, the external chain is going to be size one, essentially, if always. Um, and th that has been empirically validated. You can generate collisions if you, someone uh, who follows the stream spent a bunch of time trying to generate collisions, and he did manage to generate collisions, but it still worked. It just slowed down because you start getting, rather than roughly constant time lookup speed, you get linear time lookup speed uh, once you start getting a lot of collisions. But, uh, but yeah, that's the design concept.
right? So yeah, the table, the the map, uh, the map, the hash map here is doing linear probing, but then I am hanging off of that a linear, an external chain that is a linear li linked list essentially. Um, and that's something you can do, by the way, in general with data structures like this. You can hash on a part of the key, like a prefix of the key, for example. Like um, if you know what a try is or a radix tree, a radix tree, for example, that is dispatching on, well, if it's a string try, it's dispatching on one, one character at a time and drilling down. And if you can think of a string try as being a try that contains another try, so it dispatches on some part of the key and then drills down until it's fully resolved the whole key. This is kind of the same thing, except we're first resolving on the hash of the key, which is even for a, a variable length string uh, is always a fixed sized value, namely the 64-bit hash. And then for things that collide on that um, hash, we further drill down using the linear chain. But because there's so few collisions, essentially never, unless you're intentionally like doing an attack like a malicious attacker um the external chain is almost like uh just just there as a failsafe and that's been empirically validated that for normal data you only ever get one one hit um so that's the idea but yeah so it's kind of a special case of the more general notion of subdividing a key space in some way by hanging index structures off of each other where you have a first tier structure that handles part of the key space, and then you can further resolve the key space by hanging other structures off of that. Um, and in this case, the first tier does such a good job that we really only need the second tier, which is the external chained linked list. We only really need that as a failsafe um, for very exceptional cases. That's the idea. Um, another example of that, which people sometimes use in practice, is um, what's an example like in a try for example some pe sometimes people use tries for the top level or radix trees for the top few levels of an index structure because at those at the at the higher levels often it's quite densely packed um, but then once you drill down into the tree things become much more sparse and so one thing that's quite common and i think this is called like a hash map hash, hash array map try or something like that um, you use tries at the upper levels of the tree, and then when things become sparse, uh, a hash table is better than those structures um, because hash tables deal very well with sparse data. And so that's another example of that general trick, but here we're hashing um, as well. So, cool. All right. Um, that might be it for today if people don't have other questions. So like I said, uh, I think we're almost done with the assembly tutorial stuff. We'll cover f uh, how to deal with functions and managing the stack and stuff like that next time. Um, if I forgot about something that you were, were curious about, uh, let me know on the forums or Twitter or Discord or whatever. Um, but otherwise, uh, next time I hope to finish that off. And I want to start getting to hardware design sometimes next week, at least this, this, the, the early starting point of that. So um, that's going to be the next major topic now that we've we've done some pretty substantial stuff with our assembler and um, written a big assembly program and stuff like that, or big, big, not, not huge assembly program, but something substantial beyond just uh, trivial test cases. So I want to get to hardware design next. So that's it for today. Uh, see everyone next time and have a good weekend.